thank you very much, Matt, and thanks to the Northwood Public Library for having me here tonight. Um, before I start, I'm curious how many of you, when you look at this array of beautiful products that I have on the tables in front of us, have at least one of these items in your home? Doesn't have the exact same brand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Show of hands. Right. And don't forget, even if you think you're a... Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So most people have these products at home. Um, these, each and every one of these products has a military uh, provenance somehow. So um, in the core, I'm going to talk a little bit about that tonight. And then at the end, if I haven't covered the item um, that you have at home or one that you are curious about, you can ask me questions. Um, usually the first uh, question that I get when people hear the title of my book, Combat Ready Kitchen, How the U.S. Military Shapes the Way You Eat, is, wow, that is a really fascinating topic. And then they say, how did you get into that? <laughs> so I'm going to tell you, it's actually um, kind of surprising, which is one day, a few years ago when I was making lunch for my uh, two daughters to take with them you know, on their various adventures outside the home. I was sitting there and I may have been a little bit caffeine deprived at that particular moment, <laughs> feeling a little grouchy, and I was slapping together um, a sandwich which I was making uh, to accompany a bunch of items and packages. And I was thinking, well, okay, my sandwich is sort of the healthy homemade part of the lunch. And then I said, ah, in my grumpy state, well, but really, these things that I'm putting in my sandwich, the bread, uh, the packaged deli meat, the cheese, and even the mayo, they really have sort of a long shelf life. And they either have been sitting in my refrigerator or in my cupboard, and before that they were in a supermarket, and before that they were in a manufacturing facility somewhere. And in fact, they're probably not any fresher than the other things that I had in my lunchbox, which were a granola bar and some, uh, some goldfish crackers and a juice pouch. So after my kids went off to school, I said, OK, I'm going to do a little research on this. And I'm a food writer. And at that time, I'd started to kind of get very into industrial food. And I was interested in um, the history and also the science. And I had started to read a lot of food science. So after they left, I got into this project of doing research on the origins of long shelf life in each of the items I mentioned, the bread, the cheese, the deli meat, and the mayo. And so, in fact, I then went on and published a post about this piece, which is um, on a PBS blog where I was a contributor, which was kind of a takedown of, this, of the all-American sandwich and saying it was really not so fresh and healthy as we all believed. But as I did my research, I ended up noticing that for two of the items, for the supermarket bread and for the packaged deli meat, there was this reference to what to me, and I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts, was an obscure US Army base, the Natick Soldier <laughs> System Center. <laughs> and it seemed to me such an important thing that I did not mention it in my piece, because every now and then you come across some sort of what we call journalistic goal. I said, this is something big. I'm going to do more research on this. So after I filed off that story, I started to do research on the Natick Center itself. Um, and so what I found out about it, first of all, it was right nearby me, 15 um, minutes west of Boston. It is one of 80 Defense Department laboratories around the country. Um, it, and there, they have actually about 10 to 12 different programs. And they all have to do with supporting the individual soldier, doing research and development on things to support the individual soldier. So that means um, things like uh, tents. It means uh, shoes, uh, textiles, and combat armor, uh, airdrop equipment, and of course, combat rations. So um, I then 
said, okay, this Natick Center, and in particular, this program called the Combat Feeding Directorate, I you know, did a lot of reading and I found that it was mentioned in a lot of different food science breakthroughs um, in the 20th century and a lot of different food projects. I said, okay, this, something's going on here. I gotta find out what this is. So I ended up uh, pitching it to uh, my agent and we decided it would be a good topic for a book. And then they actually allowed me on site. So there I uh, get to visit this sort of center of uh, the sort of the, all the science that goes into processed food. And that happens in, they have this, this special building and it's uh, all surrounded by this field equipment where, which is usually deployed in the, you know, out during, uh, in the theater, it could be uh, a combat kitchen, it, it could be um, a containerized chapel, and so there are all this sort of stuff around it. And then you go in, and there's a, uh, it's a kind of a biggish building, has 300 employees, uh, most of whom are civilians, many food scientists and food technologists. And there, um, they spend all year doing research on and perfecting combat rations, which by congressional mandate have to be able to last for three years at 80 oh. degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> so um, they're, pretty, they're very concerned with this thing called shelf life. Um, so there are two main um, lines of combat ration, and I'm gonna hold up one of them. This actually comes from the Natick Center. I got it from one, on one of my visits. This is the MRE. Um, most people have heard of the MRE, yes. Maybe some of you have eaten them. Let's see, maybe our librarian. <laughs> yes? Yeah, okay. So um, the MRE was actually first fielded back in 1981. Um, and it, it was new because, let's see if I have it, that it had, an entree in a foil and plastic pouch, which was the military's replacement for the tin can. Um, and inside it has sort of like a wet entree that you can eat and heat up with a, um, a flameless ration heater. There also has bread in a foil package. It has, let's see, um, pound cake. This is, this was um, another military breakthrough which has to do with being able to keep bakery items at um, soft and chewy for a long time. It will have candy. Um, I think I was admonished by somebody not to forget the hot sauce, hot sauce. Um, and you will have maybe a processed cheese spread and the little snacky item, like a combo. The second uh, major combat ration line for individual soldiers is the first strike ration. And this is actually something that the military came up with in um, the early 2000s when after uh, or dur during the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, commanding officers noticed that the uh, soldiers were doing what they called field stripping the MRE, which meant that they went inside the MRE and they took out only the things that were snacky yeah. and they took those with them into battle. And the problem with that is that they, MRE was designed to give full nutrition across mm. all the different items. Mm. So when they did it, they weren't getting full nutrition. So instead of you know, making the guys and girls eat their, uh, their entrees, they decided that they would just develop this whole snackier ration and so that has things like and I have one here shelf stable three year shelf stable sandwiches and will now have pizza um, wrapped uh, it has wraps it has beef jerky uh, it has um, energy bars it has candy and a, what do you use <laughs> three year shelf three stable years. sandwich yeah <laughs> No, this is incredible. So, yeah. How was it that you were 
able to go into this place and like ask all these questions and get on site? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, private or top secret or like. They, so I'm going to, and we can do this one of two ways, and I think it kind of makes sense if you guys have a question just to ask it, because we're a smallish group, um, so, you know, feel free. Um, I, for, first of all, they love publicity, um, because they develop all this neato food science, and so if you ha are going to be um, publicizing that, you know, that's great. And so it wasn't too hard for me to get um, a pass. Once you get onto the facility, yes, you have to go through, you know, they do a background check, they check your car, they, um, you have to go in through this sort of thing with all the concrete barriers. And I, I don't think I got frisked, but yeah. So, so it's, but they were, they were very friendly and they were very helpful. And what, a question I often get is, you know, how cooperative they were. I do note that while the Natick Center itself was incredibly cooperative in the research, sometimes people on the first, second, and third circle out were not so cooperative. So many of their collaborators, they work with a lot of different food science departments and universities, or certainly not industrial collaborators, did not want to talk to me, and I asked a lot, oh. a lot of people. So I ended up in the book, um, I ended up talking mostly to European food scientists and retired food scientists. So those are the people who just felt um, most comfortable. Yeah. So um, yeah, that was how. Okay. So I'm going to um, switch gears a little bit and talk. Um, I don't think that this says anything very good about us, but combat rations have pretty much been around since the beginning of human history. Um, they go back to ancient Sumer, which um, if anybody knows about this, they was sort of this system of 18 or so city-states. They're all in close geographic proximity, and they basically spent all their time fighting. Um, so <laughs> they were so close, and I like to say that they could actually go home for lunch in the middle of, <laughs> of fighting, but so they didn't really have uh, very sophisticated rations. They were like uh, barley cakes, I believe, and beer, which they loved, yeah. and Sumerians actually devoted, I think, 60% of their crops um, to the production of beer. <laughs> yeah. So I want you to pay a little bit of attention to what I'm going to, these historical details, and then I'm going to ask you to try and identify some of the important qualities for combat rations. Okay. So our next stop is Egypt. And Egypt's uh, rations were, uh, ancient Egypt, I should mention, um, similar to those of the, the Sumerians, with the addition of something very important, which was a bit of dried fish. Now, this dried fish um, was so vital to the Egyptian army that it was actually given to the soldiers uh, every three months as part of their payment. Uh, let's see, my next stop, okay, uh, let's go to Rome. Uh, the Roman legionnaires carried a, a bit of cheese, kind of like a, a Parmesan, hardtack, uh, hard tack is like a very, it's like a cracker, um, it's twice baked, incredibly hard and also incredibly uh, durable, it can last for a really long time. And then they carried all sorts of cured pork products. Does that sound familiar? They carried sort of the prosciuttos, hams, sausages, and so forth. And the reason for this is, uh, were two things. One is that the Roman uh, soldiers were actually farmers, and only um, Roman citizens were citizen farmer soldiers, and so they had these farms, and they uh, grew pigs because, um, you know, pigs are easy to feed, and they also, um, uh, reproduce frequently and with lots of piglets and these grow very large and produce a lot of protein. And the second reason is that the Romans controlled the world salt trade. And so this allowed them then to take that salt and um, cure all those, those pork products. Okay, our next stop are going to be the Mongols. Now the Mongols are sort of like the precursors to today's special ops. They're incredibly tough. And that was sort of something that they uh, prided themselves on. They spent uh, days on end 
supposedly on their horses riding around and when they one horse got tired they would switch in a horse from a string that ran behind them they slept on the ground <laughs> with no blankets according apparently uh, and then their uh, fare was kind of along the same lines they invented powdered milk um, which is they, a, a might have been mayor milk but it was dried and then it was reconstituted by putting it in, with water into a saddlebag and then in the shaking of the horse yeah. um, make that a, a, a good beverage and the second thing they uh, ate was a type of jerky that was cured with the weight of the saddle and the horses uh, and the rider over um, the horse between the saddle and, and the horse's sweat would come up and and make that sort of a cured cured piece of jerky oh wait there's one more item um, which is for their emergency ration when food ran out they would slit a vein in the horse's neck and drink hot blood. Oh, wow. So, okay, they were tough. They were very tough. Um, okay, so then, then we'll briefly touch on our, the Vikings. The Vikings pretty, had a very boring set of uh, combat rations. They, I think they ate a sort of a mush, and then a, bar a barley mush again, a dried cod, butter. They added some butter in there. Um, and then our final stop will be uh, with our neighbors to the south, the Aztecs. And the Aztecs had a very interesting system, which is their, their uh, daily fare for soldiers um, was all vegetarian, um, which were uh, corn tortillas, uh, various kind of seeds, pumpkin, uh, amaranth, and I forgot there's one more in there. And um, you know, they kind of would moisten it and that was the, and they livened it up with their chili peppers. However, as some of you know, um, when they would uh, have a, a, the spoils of war, they would end up taking some of the, uh, the enemy soldiers and bringing them back and sacrificing them. And these were then ritualistically eaten. Uh, each warrior was allowed to serve his or her, well his, captive, and then um, providing a part of that to Moctezuma and sharing the rest with his buddies, but was not allowed to actually eat it himself. Um, and I should say that in recounting this, I got myself into a great deal of trouble, apparently on the Reddit. Do you guys know what Reddit is? So. <laughs> you can go look that up. Um, okay, so now that's sort of my quick overview of rations throughout history, and I'm wondering if you notice any similarities, any qualities um, that seem to be a sort of a constant with the rations. No fruits and vegetables. The, what? No fruits. No fruits. Of, well, that's actually yeah. Well, that let's take the inverse of that, which is that there's a protein, right? Yeah. 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 And so that actually, um, not with the first rations with the Sumerians, but um, shortly thereafter, that became important to have some form of dried protein. Yeah. Any others? They last for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> well. Um, well, was it? But it's probably better than putting Wait, sorry. I mean, did it last long? Yeah, they were. Yes, they were. They tended to be imperishable. They were dried or, um, you know, smoked or cured. And anything else? They're mostly carbohydrates. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's also probably true. Yeah. Yeah. What was? I don't see any spam up there. Oh. Uh, <laughs> well, you are correct. So the spam should be there, and this is kind of like it's it, it, it's uh, peers right here, and we can talk about that when we get that. That's a World War II treat, yeah. Um, so, so there. Uh, the other thing is that they are light, so that they're portable. So the qualities that you want in a ration, and this is true today, is you want it to be um, lightweight, you want it to be imperishable, you want it to be rugged and you want it to be nourishing and I will add one more for um, the US military today which is you want it to be economical yeah okay so um, now what I'm going to do is fast forward uh, a couple 
um, many centuries actually, uh, to the French Revolutionary War and um, also the American Revolutionary War. And if you looked at what soldiers were eating during those engagements, you would find that it was remarkably similar to what the Roman legionnaires had eaten 2,000 years earlier. They had carried a bit of flour, some beans, um, some lard, and, 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 uh, sorry, and bacon. And they would make their own meals. And the reason that that was, had not changed in such a long time was that no new uh, food preservation techniques had been invented because people were still using the same old ones of drying and uh, pickling and not really using sugar too much because it wasn't invented, but uh, smoking and so forth. So um, all that was about to change because during the French Revolutionary War, both citizens and soldiers experienced hunger and starvation. And probably because of that, Shortly thereafter, the French um, agricultural department decided to have this contest and they would see if they could get people who were interested in uh, food preservation to come up with a new way to preserve food. And they offered a reward of 12,000 francs. So um, at that time, there was a young man whose name was Nicolas Appert. I don't know if anybody recognizes that name, and he had been actually a celebrity chef, um, sort of like a bad boy celebrity chef, because he cooked for who were the stars at that time, which were uh, royalty and, uh, and, wealth, and the wealthy. And he was able to retire quite young and open up a candy shop. So um, the candy shop, as it turned out, would be the perfect place to do food science experiments because it has all kinds of specialized equipment. And so um, he began working at night trying to figure out a way to preserve food. And he, and he came up with this method, which was to um, put food inside a, a, a glass vessel, put that inside a big the metal vessel of boiling water and cook it at a slow, steady heat for a period of time, then putting a stopper on um, the first vessel, and that was it. And this way he was able to actually um, preserve vegetables and fruits and, uh, and sort of stews and so forth. Uh, it took him a while uh, to perfect this, but when he did, he started bringing samples to um, the French military and the French agriculture department and it took them terribly long to get back to him. And they were always like asking him to, ch complaining about something that it, the broth wasn't thick enough or asking him to bring new samples. And a whole, almost a decade elapsed between the time that they um, started the contest. And he eventually brought in, I think, some kind of a stew and he heard back that he had won the prize and um, that he was then going to be, his invention would be uh, used in the, in the French military. He, uh, in return for those 12,000 francs, he of course would have to relinquish his right um, to his invention. So what do you think? Was that a good idea? <laughs> no. <laughs> that invention was? Canning. Yeah. yeah. So um, after that, the glass vessel got turned into a can by some English guys across the channel. Okay, his name was Peter Duran. And it was started to be used to preserve all sorts of food, beginning of, again with you know the Navy and the military who would get these huge cans, massive of food, because it took um, the technology to be able to produce this sort of thing was such that a canning company could make six cans a day because they were made by hand. Wow. <laughs> so it was, it was special, but eventually it, got, it, it reached um, the consumer market and became widespread in the course of several years. That, sorry, in the course of about a century. Um, so the second uh, major time that the military became involved in food science was during World War II, 
when the US military suddenly had to ramp up from feeding 400,000 to 11.6 million troops. When we began the war, um, there was actually no, uh, no food research laboratory at all in the military, but there, were a, there had been a small lab which was created from two guys who uh, had been part of the Army's cooking school, and then the cooking school had moved it from Chicago uh, to Philadelphia, and these two guys were left behind and they didn't have a job. So <laughs> they wrote uh, to, uh, to their supervisor and asked if they could then create a research laboratory. And he said, yeah. So the, the, this lab had these two guys um, and a secretary. It had no specialized equipment except for a bunch of borrowed pots and pans. It had no outside um, budget for projects of any kind. And it had two rations. One was uh, the C ration, which is actually pretty similar to this. And this had was in one of the guy's inventions. Um, and his thought was, well, you know, it's, it's more, we can't give the guys steaks, but we can give them something like a meat and potatoes thing in a can. And the other thing was uh, what's called the D ration which is a deliberately unpalatable chocolate bar. And that had been developed by one of the Colonel Logan, um, also was called the Logan Bar in his honor. And the idea there was that you didn't, it was an emergency ration um, so that people wouldn't eat it right away. Neither of these rations fared very well when it came to the war for various reasons. First of all, they didn't taste very good. Um, but second, um, they experienced a lot of deterioration when they were shipped all around the globe in different um, climates and so forth, and their packaging wasn't very good, so it fell apart. Um, and that created a real crisis in the military, which ended up uh, being sort of converging with the Bataan March, which had, um, was exacerbated by starvation of the prisoners. And so uh, at that time, the military said, we have to do something about this ration issue. They did, and they ended up creating the biggest food science uh, research program that had ever been known and probably is still ever known. And that little laboratory was expanded from three people to 300 people during the course of the war years. It was expanded from having no specialized equipment to having special labs that did research on um, vitamins, food chemistry, sensory um, evaluation, and, um, and, and packaging. And it went from having no outside projects to having over 500 outside projects with um, industry and university collaborators. So that system actually still exists. That is the Natick Center system. And the reason it still exists is something really interesting, which is that after World War II, um, the government decided that it had been so difficult to ramp up for, to meet um, that challenge, the global challenge, that rather than uh, return everything to normal that would maintain both the military and the suppliers that supported it in a state of perpetual readiness. Mm -hmm. And that is called preparedness. And we still live that. Um, and so in the field of food, what that meant is that the Combat Feeding Directorate wants to make sure that any uh, research and development that goes into combat rations is disseminated to um, private food companies so that it can then turn to them, one, and ask them if there's ever, and I want to knock on wood because I think we're a little closer than we used to be, a World War III, um, or, uh, and they can then convert their production lines to rations very quickly. And the second thing is that if you 
put the food science that goes into rations in consumer food items, then you can actually use some of those consumer food items um, in the ration, which is something that the military does now. All right, so having explained the whole system, I'm going to uh, go back to where we started, um, which is the lunchbox. And um, now we're going to talk about some of these items that I have for my daughter and talk about some of the military influences on them. Okay. So my first item here <laughs> is the sandwich. And I don't even have to unwrap the sandwich to get to my military influence because guess what? The plastic film that you wrap your sandwich in is a military invention. And it, uh, it actually dates back to World War II when uh, there were, and in part because of this issue with the rations that I talked about and them falling apart and the packaging wasn't very good. Well, one of the reasons was that um, the packaging of the day, which was cellophane, is based on cellulose. Cellulose is a plant sugar, and it's not a very good water barrier. And so that me meant that when things wrapped in cellophane were sent all around the world, they, they were emitting water and getting soggy and so forth. So um, as part of this huge classified research program on creating synthetic substitutes for many different items um, that were used in everyday life, and this was just massive, I mean, pretty much Anything that you we have in plastic today may have comes up from that program, from uh, sh shoe soles to suitcases to shower curtains to ring coats to um, utensil handles, so on and so forth. And then, of course, this um, food packaging. So, uh, what the team did? The team was uh, headed by a guy named Herman Mark, who is a very famous. Uh, European polymer scientist who fled the Nazis and it was entered at the Brooklyn uh, Polytechnic Institute and so there this whole team of chemists were trying to come up with this you know uh, uh, pa food packaging that would be a good water barrier and what they did is they approached Dow Chemical um, to see if you know what kind of materials they had and Dow had had, had invented this thing called Ceram yeah so yeah. So I guess sort of they're not allowed to patent. They, I guess they can't patent something while it's being used by the military. Right, because they were in a special circumstance. So they they, they waited until they had that that um, you know freedom, and it became. I, they, I'm sure they had an agreement. You know, they said we want to go patent this, and so there's probably some, some conversations that happened there. All right. So remember, we're still in our sandwich. Okay. So here we have our second item here. How many of you eat this kind of bread? Yeah. No? A few of you. Oh, I eat it. Okay. All right. Has anybody um, ever noticed that supermarket bread is really soft and squishy and stays just like fresh forever? Have you noticed that? Don't you think that is a little bit weird? Is that weird? Okay. Well, um, it turns out not, you know, traditional bread, bread that you bakers baked in ovens, literally starts to stale the minute it comes out of the oven. And that's because um, it, it's made by getting the starch molecule wet and it kind of spreads around and once it comes out of the oven it starts to cool, that hardens. Um, so that's a problem in preserving bread and it's a, it was a problem for the army which at one point decided they wanted to create a canned bread. Um, until that time they'd actually had a special uh, battalion of army bakers whose mission it was was just to, cr to bake fresh bread wow. yeah in the camp. I mean it's kind of nice yeah. um, but the problem with that was you that was great in garrison which I hear our um, librarian was a cook and you were in garrison but when you're out in the field you don't have any you don't have any uh, any bread you'd have to eat the the hardtack um, and that was a problem so so in the 1950s the army decided they wanted to come up with a canned bread and so the first there were lots of technical issues but one of the first was this thing of staling so um, to understand what they did we're gonna have to talk about enzymes 
Enzymes are um, molecules, biological molecules, that speed up chemical reactions by factors of millions. And so um, in bread, uh, there's a, a uh, enzyme called amylase. What amylase does is it breaks down starch into sugars, which are then um, used by the yeast to produce carbon dioxide, which makes the bread rise, which makes the bread really uh, lovely, light and fluffy and tasty. So in traditional bread, you have two sources of amylase. You have um, amylase from the wheat, which is a plant, and you have um, an amylase from the yeast, which is a fungus. So both wheat and yeast like a relatively cool temperature range. So what happens is that when you bake your bread, um, those enzymes are inactivated. And so after baking, you know, the starch complexes reform and it gets stale. So what um, the army did, and in this case it was working with a university contract, which was Kansas State University, is they had Kansas State take the same uh, enzyme, but from a bacterial source. Now, some bacteria um, are very heat tolerant, so they took one from a heat tolerant bacteria and added that to the bread instead. And so the, uh, the amylase does, is not inactivated after baking, and it continues to break down the starch. Now, it, was not, it didn't work out really well at the beginning. In fact, it turned the bread kind of gummy and, and ended up taking probably four decades after they had done this initial research. But that technique is now used in probably all supermarket bread like this. And um, these amylases are, come from an Icelandic a hot spring bacteria. And they're produced by the Danish uh, giant Novozymes, and they keep your bread fresh. All right, next on to, okay. okay here we have packaged deli meat. Um, and this actually comes, <laughs> you're looking startled, yeah. Okay, um, this actually comes out of a 1960s effort uh, by the military to reduce the cost of its meat bill by 60%. So um, what they did was, at the time, um, and this is actually another military innovation and it dates back to the, the First and Second World Wars, um, is that they uh, switched from buying a whole carcass, which is expensive and they gives you different types of cuts, to buying beef in boxes where you can specify the cut. And they decided what they wanted to do is buy the cheapest cuts there were and give those to uh, the recruits. And, but, but first, what they were gonna do is to try and turn that into something that actually looked like a steak. So it wasn't, it wasn't just giving them I don't know what it was, you know, organ meat. They were going to turn that into something that looked like a steak. And so this is where the food science comes in. Um, the, this, it took the better part of a decade. Um, and there are sort of four like important technological breakthroughs. One of those was the invention of meat glue by collaborator Oscar Mayer. Um, <laughs> another was just sort of this an improvement in some of the um, meat cutting uh, equipment that they started to use uh, an equipment that kind of retained the juice. Um, a third was just a better understanding of how animal muscle fibers work both in dead and, and live animals. And then finally that the addition of a chemical called phosphate to the meat would help the molecules spread it apart and help it retain its juiciness. So all these things together, um, they finally kind of figured out a way to make these, what they were calling fabricated meats. And um, sure enough, in the early 1970s, they started to field um, two soldiers, things, the fabricated beef steaks, um, fabricated lamb chops, fabricated, I think it was veal steaks and fabricated pork chops. Um, and 
Uh, this was great news because they were finally able to you know, use the cheapest cuts of meat there were. It was also great news for anybody who had um, a mind to make a profit. And so some of the contractors on that project went to the fast food industry and said, hey, we have this great new technology. We can, we can make things that taste like what are called um, muscle cuts but they're not really muscle cuts. And so, of course, the fast food companies are very interested in the very, one of the very first to appear um, was the McRib yeah. in 1981. And so uh, the interesting thing about, about that was when the McRib first appeared on the menu, customers would not eat it. And they actually had to give it away to get people to try it. And it took quite a long time for the public to really enjoy it. Um, but then eventually it did and it became this thing, as you all, all know, which people say is, it only appears when they have enough of these sort of cheap cuts on the market from doing all the trim. You've heard of it. Okay. So that then um, quickly made its way into the rest of the supermarket because, of course, if you can make, you know, fast food items, you can also make um, cutlets and nuggets and, and so when you go into the supermarket anything that looks really uniform and yeah. even and is patty that's a uh, fabricated or it is now called a restructured meat product from the army okay our last oh, this one I'm going to move on. This is a processed cheese, and the processed cheese itself was not from um, the military, but I will say that Kraft probably got the critical bump in sales when it first sold um, millions and millions of uh, quarter, uh, four ounce tins of processed cheese to the military during World War I. Okay, now I'm going to go on to a couple other items here in my lunchbox, though. Speaking of cheese, yeah. cheese. Now, um, doesn't cheese powder? Things with cheese powder are delicious, aren't they? Like yeah. Cheetos and Goldfish and Annie's. And I don't have Doritos, but Doritos too. Well, yeah, the military had a hand in that as well. Okay. So cheese powder actually dates back again to World War II. Mm -hmm. And remember I said how many mouths there were to, to feed overseas? Millions. And that cost a lot of money because they were shipping a lot of food overseas. So the quartermaster corps decided, okay, we, we're going to reduce um, the weight and volume of this, of this food. So what do you think they did? If you know some, what, what's the major component of all food? Water. Water, right. So what they did is dehydrate everything. And they dehydrated milk, they dehydrated eggs, vegetables, um, herbs and spices, and then they decided to dehydrate cheese. Now, cheese does not have an internal structure. So when you dehydrate it, guess what happens? It turns into a powder, right. So not to be deterred, um, the quartermaster could just pack these, this powder into little tins and ship those overseas where army cooks use them um, to flavor entrees, to make sauces, um, and to make side dishes. After the end of the war, uh, there was a whole cheese dehydration industry which had sprung up in Wisconsin where American cheddar is produced and it no longer had a customer. So, uh, what it did was turn to the grocery manufacturers of America, which then was kind of a nascent organization, but has become increasingly powerful um, since the time. And it offered this new product as an ingredient um, for some of the food that they were starting to formulate, which included a lot of uh, snack and convenience foods. One of the very first of those was the Cheeto. And the Cheeto um, is actually an extruded corn dough. Um, extrusion um, puts a lot of, cooks something with a lot of pressure by pushing it through this kind of chamber. It puffs up under that pressure and it's then coated with hot oil and dusted with delicious cheese powder. All right, let's see. 
this one's going to be a little quick one. <laughs> this package that we give to our kids, this is pretty much a straight up ration package, okay? Um, this is the foil, uh, laminated foil and plastic package that I was telling you about at the beginning um, that enabled the MRE to be this easy thing with a bunch of packages rather than clunky cans. So this is something that the military um, created to replace the tin can. It allowed that it reduced cost. It was less cumbersome and clunky. And in fact, the cans had been the source of um, injuries sometimes with soldiers. So uh, it, that took quite a while and it hit in the Asian market first, but it eventually is started to appear in our supermarkets. So here's some more ration packages. More kid oh, yeah. stuff. All right. And my final lunchbox item. Okay, raise your hands if you have one of these on your person, <laughs> in your home, or at the office. Ooh, okay, good. All right, so this is actually the culmination of almost 100 years of research into finding an emergency ration that was small, um, light, and nutritionally dense. It actually began uh, at the end of the uh, 18th century with chocolate. And at the time, Germans had decided that they were no longer going to motivate men with spirits, which is how soldiers had been motivated before. <laughs> and they were going to switch to chocolate and sugar, which is probably not quite as good from the guy's perspective, but still, it's nice. Um, and so the US Army followed suit, but they quickly found out two things. First, chocolate is delicious. And second, people will not wait to eat a chocolate bar. They eat it right away, so it didn't work very well as an emergency ration. Um, so what they decided to do is to make it less tasty. Oh. Great thinking. <laughs> um, and they added, uh, let's see, um, it was oat flour, lecithin, and some, um, some, some uh, egg component with a couple other secret ingredients. And they ended up sort of swinging the pendulum in the other direction. And it became so unpalatable that when they did a taste test by sending guys to the woods with these emergency rations, that they refused to eat them and began to starve. And, and this is according to the official report, begged food from the other campsites. Um, so that didn't work out very well. That was the early 1900s. And then, uh, it, this sort of got backburnered for a while until right before the um, Second World War, when one of these guys who I told you about, who had been an employee of the Army, uh, the Quartermaster's um, cooking school, realized that he didn't have a job. So he decided to revive this. Um, and what he did is he came up, he t tweaked the formulation, and eventually he went to Hershey. And Hershey produced um, this bar, which was kind of, uh, the dough was so dense that it had to be pressed by hand into these special molds. And it became this deration and was eaten um, you know, by soldiers all around the globe during World War II. So that kind of, that actually continued to be produced up until the modern day. And so this sort of meltless chocolate bar is something that that soldiers are still eating. But it, the, uh, the army sort of was still looking for a better kind of emergency ration. And uh, that then took a little detour into another uh, technology that lost its customer during World War II, which was freeze dehydration. Mm -hmm. Now, freeze dehydration was originally used not for food, but for blood products. So, um, and it was, and, and what it would, that, of course, because blood, like food, is you know, a lot of water. And if you reduce or eliminate the water, you can then ship over these dry blood uh, products to the battlefield. Um, so after the war, there was a lot of uh, freeze dehydration equipment that didn't have a function. And they began to experiment with all sorts of food. And they were able to do some things quite well, including Beverages actually work really well for fused dehydration. 
because yeah. freeze dehydration captures the volatile oils inside. Um, and it, those are then released when you add the water. But it didn't work so well for other things like meat, which it kind of turned into sort of the equivalent of a meat flavored loofah. Um, <laughs> so they kept, they kept working on that. But uh, they were optimistic. And they came up with this idea that, um, in fact, they were going to feed soldiers food that would have this whole combat feeding system that was only dehydrated food. Um, and they were going to just have this system of bars. There's going to be this, a cereal bar or a bacon and eggs bar. There's going to be, for lunch, you could have like a macaroni and cheese bar or a pea soup bar. And on, on and on. They, there was, the interesting twist on this was that they decided also that, because everybody likes to season their food, right, um, that they were going to distribute little booklets of laminated seasonings oh. of different kinds. So they had like a little sheet of jelly or a little sheet of soy sauce um, or a little sheet of cat that you could put on top of your bar to flavor it however you want them. Um, so this was the idea. And it, that never got fielded. Um, but what did happen was in the late 1950s when NASA was looking for a way to feed astronauts, it began to work with the Navy Center. And the Navy Center said, hey, have we got an idea for you? We're going to do dehydrated, and they weren't bars, because bars, if you eat them in zero gravity, crumble. And that can either be a choking hazard for the astronauts um, or it can clog the equipment in the console. So um, they turned those into little cubes, so little dehydrated cubes that would go up into space. And in fact, this is how um, the astronauts on the first man uh, space flights were fed, which these little cubes. So they turned out also to be terrible. Um, not only did the astronauts complain sorely, but they apparently suffered from anorexia, which is not eating enough constipation and general malaise after their, um, their flights. But it worked in terms of feeding. <laughs> However, the Natick Center also saw that that was just not going to be work in the long term. So while they continued to produce all these, uh, dehyd these dehydrated foods, they began to investigate something else, which is something called, um, it, it was related to a new concept that had come out of Australia in understanding the wa how water um, affects the possibility of microbial contamination. And until then, um, scientists had thought just however much water there was in a food, that was how um, you know, sort of the, the water would be available for uh, bacteria or fungi to grow in. But this new concept said, well, a lot of that water is already kind of bound to the food and molecules. So let's just look at what's left over. And it turned out that, that this was the right approach because you could then um, make the food, keep the food a lot moister. And by adding certain kinds of ingredients, such as sugar and salt, maintain a moist and chewy mouthfeel. So using this, which became uh, known as the intermediate moisture food, they developed this whole other line of uh, energy bars. And so the very first of these went up into space on the Apollo 15 mission. It was a apricot flavored uh, granola bar, much like our modern uh, energy bars. And again, just like with the other stories, contractor on the project said, this is a gold mine. And, lit and literally, I think the same contractor um, taught, uh, shared that technology with Pillsbury, Quaker Oats, um, General Mills, and so forth. So there's this whole first generation of granola bars that appeared in the, uh, in the 1970s and early 80s. It then became sort of this thing for long distance runners and dieters. And then it eventually spread to be kid food and everybody's food. And it now takes up a quarter aisle of the supermarket. Thanks to the military. OK. Um, I could go on and on. And I have many other products here. Um, but I'm going to stop. However, in the book, I do um, take the reader on a supermarket tour. And I take off from the shelf um, every item that has a military provenance you know, or influence. And I estimate that we would leave the store half empty. Mm -hmm. wow. Yeah. Um, 
So at, at, after I finished writing my book, um, my editor said, okay, well, I want you to imagine you know, a system that, that you know, didn't have this military influence. And I really, I tried hard and I couldn't imagine what it would be like, um, what our food system would be like. I think it has grown up entangled in this military influence. But then led me to a, sort of this even greater realization, which is, um, do you remember how at the beginning I said that the Natick Center is one of 80 Defense Department laboratories nationwide? Mm -hmm. And I'm just describing one program, which is among you know, one of 10 or 12 there. This process that I'm describing of technology transfer and influence on um, consumer culture and our civilian lives is going on all around us. It's not just in food, it's in um, textiles, it's in chemistry, it's in automotive, it's in construction materials. Um, we all know the technology examples of this, right? From GPS, the internet, to the mm -hmm. you know, uh, airplanes, to tel uh, cellular telephones, and on and on. And so this is process is going on all around us. And I think we don't notice it because we live in it. Mm. But we are incredibly militarized in this, in this sense. So that's, that's the end of sort of my prepared uh, comments. But if you have questions or comments or want to come up here and pick out a food item, I can also tell you its history. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I was wondering about freeze-dried foods for hikers and campers. Yeah. Is that the kind of freeze Absolutely. Food, you know? Same thing. In fact, that's a very interesting point. And um, uh, all of those sorts of items that uh, campers use, that comes from the military. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In fact, I used to backpack in the 80s and we used to read some of that astronaut ice cream in those little cubes. The ice cream? <laughs> oh, yeah. The freeze. The, that's, that's a classic yeah, one, right? Yeah. Was, yeah. Weird. It was like dissolved in your mouth. I was thinking about visualizing a chicken bouillon. <coughs> the, is chicken that bouillon. Or? Okay. I'm not sure about bouillon, but I can say that, for example, if you use those soup packets, oh, yeah. those yeah. include some of the, um, well, it may not be freeze uh, dried, but it, it may, it's certainly dehydrated um, herbs and spices and vegetables, and which comes out of that <laughs> yeah. little program that we talked about. Yeah. How is the rice preserved? Is it just dried or is it something else? Oh, this is actually a really interesting thing. Um, the story on this was this process is actually an ancient um, Indian from India uh, technique for preparing and preserving rice. And while I had always thought of this as being something that was not very good for you, it turns out that parboiled rice is better for you than white rice because it's sort of um, boiled and then the vitamins and minerals go in, penetrate um, the, the rice seed. So he, this was something that a British chemist was working on for like 10 years and he couldn't find a customer. Again, I think this is a World War II thing. He went, um, he made contact with a, a sales guy in the United States and he explained this idea and the sales guy took his, um, this product as well as many studies on how it retained the vitamins and minerals and brought it to the quartermaster court and said this is a great thing you can make rice in camps and they said yes and so they ended up setting up four different factories where they produced this parboiled rice and then after the war it became this product. Oh. So why don't they call it Uncle Sam's rice? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> There's an another product actually that the same era is, um, you know, those uh, frozen juice con concentrates, that whole um, system of, it's a slow system of, of concentrating the juice and pulling the water out was developed by a military contractor. And in fact, they had a contract to produce the juice and then the war ended and they, so they, again, it was sort of thing they'd looked and said, okay, let's do this for the consumer market. It was tank, right? Yeah. Tang. No, the, actually, the one I'm talking about is Minute Maid, <laughs> but you're also right. Tang was Tang um, came out of I think I don't know the exact history on that, but um, I think that that whole process of freeze dehydration may have had something to do with that. I was going to uh, also. I was going to yeah, go ahead. 
Bag of spinach, is this something? Yeah, well, I, actually, okay. So this is something, this is, not, you know, not all the influences have um, been bad. I think this is a pretty good one. The military, particularly, uh, specifically the Navy, was uh, involved in trying to make fruits and vegetables last longer when they were shipped um, to uh, soldiers in Vietnam. And they actually worked with Whirlpool. Uh, in during the 1960s to figure out a way to do that and what they did is something called uh, controlled or modified um, atmosphere packaging and what it does is it takes the same mix of gases that we have in the air and sort of rejiggers the mix so that um, it slows down the ripening of the food. And that's what all these little packages that you get in the uh, supermarket use that so that um, the, the food doesn't go as bad as quickly. I was also going to... I'm sorry, what? You said Whirlpool, like the... Whirlpool, yes, Whirlpool. Yeah, they, and I, I was wondering about that too, exactly what the relation, because I think of them more as a heavy equipment company, but... Um, they were, I probably had to do with the refrigeration, I'm going to guess. I also wanted to bring up this because this is, I talk a lot about some of the older influences and that is um, for two reasons. One is because it takes a while for it really to enter consumer culture, but this process is going on still. It's not like, you know, it ended after World War II or the 1960s or even the 1970s. And this is something um, that you are probably all buying a product that has been use, using this new preservation technique, which is called high pressure processing, which also comes out of military research but from the 1990s. Mm -hmm. What's it called? Okay, so what this is, it uses very um, intense pressure to preserve food. And what that does is it breaks the bonds of big molecules. And some of those big molecules are um, the fats and the carbohydrates that, that are parts of living organisms like a bacteria or a fungi. So it also cooks the food with this pressure. So it ends up sort of creating this what they call a, a, a fresh-like um, taste and texture. And it really does you know, seem more like fresh food. It's not mm. quite the same. And this is used to preserve all these, um, these guacamole products because it, in, it deactivates the enzyme that turns them brown. It's also used to preserve those um, single-serving juices and um, with vegetable and fruit juices that people buy. Uh, it's used on all sorts of new lines of, has anybody seen those preservative free deli meats at the, at the supermarket that says no preservatives? Wow. No. That, that's been preserved using mm. this technique. Um, How about jello puddings? They don't have to be refrigerated. No, this has to be refrigerated. Oh, it does. So, so the, the, now you, some of these, these products, um, it slows down the uh, the deterioration, but you, they do have to be refrigerated, oh, okay. yeah. But you don't have to use preservatives, and you don't have, can use less salt and sugar. So that like, sounds like a good thing, and so far the uh, the health studies are okay. Yeah, it's like beyond canning. It's like, it makes canning last longer in a way. Yes, yeah. Yeah, it makes it last longer. I noticed spices in a cake mix over there. Oh, that. that's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> I forgot about that. Um, this one is, believe it or not, this is the result of $40 million of research oh. and development by the U.S. <laughs> Army on irradiated food, um, which is, that was one of their, they thought that was the thing that was going to really take off, and they were very wrong, unfortunately, but they spent decades and millions of taxpayer dollars doing research on how to preserve food with radiation. They had a lot of uh, difficulties for various reasons. One is that it doesn't taste good. Um, another is that you know, uh, consumers are very nervous about eating things that have been irradiated. And, um, and third, it's expensive and the equipment is, was difficult to make. It ended up uh, being used very widely for spices and herbs. And the reason why is that these are often imported and they may harbor um, mm -hmm. unwelcome, shall we say, immigrants with them. Mm -hmm. And so the, uh, using irradiation means that you can get rid of those without changing the, the flavor. 
Yeah. I wonder if you have an opinion after doing all this research on how good of a job uh, we do in the U.S. at uh, food regulation. Ooh, that's an interesting question. I don't know if, it, if you... Well, let me add, can I ask you to narrow a little bit, like, what aspect of food regulation do you mean, or...? Uh, the, the health of it. Uh, okay, safety. and the health, okay. Well, that's, okay, so, well, one of the... Pass, okay. Go ahead, yeah. Does it still have to pass, F, it must still have to pass FDA approval if, if it's within the military? Um, you no, you don't need to have, what you do need, <laughs> and a change has, <laughs> actually, this comes from the military as well, and that is, it used to have to, there was a system of inspection that was, um, you know, supposed to be quite rigorous, it wasn't always, uh, enacted that way, but uh, it, with the new Food Modernization Safety and Modernization Act, and I think it was 2011, mm -hmm. which was signed by uh, Obama, that a new system was implemented in addition, which is um, which would ask every manufacturer to have something that's called a HACCP plan, and what that is, that was a system um, hazard uh, hazard. Uh, mm -hmm. It has a hazard and, and critical control points, which is a, was developed by the Natick Center. And it was developed to keep um, the astronauts' food at a safety level, which is zero tolerance for five years. Oh. And so, this is, so it, it's, it's quite good at like ferreting out where um, problems occur. So in that sense, um, does that system work? I think, I think that on the whole, preserved foods are very safe. I mean, I, I think probably one of the accomplishments of uh, the food system, and this does go back to the Natick Center because you know they work so much on um, food safety issues and food preservation, is that our food system is incredibly safe. Now, there are areas where we need improvement. I mean, we've had like the whole issue of um, this can has its own hazards, right? Because when you're combining you know, multiple sources for spinach in the single bag, that uh, that multiplies the exposure that you might have if something if it had a contaminant. Maybe a follow-up question to that is: I wonder if they have, like in the field um with these preserved foods that have like like high concentrations of like sugar and salt and things like that if there's any like there's a rule about how long the food has to last but not a rule about uh is there a rule about how it affects people's health i see what you're saying yeah okay that's a, that's an excellent question and i think um, it's important and it relates to the topic that these foods were created to be eaten for a short period of time in a very, in an extreme situation. You're in the field, it, you know, you're you know, dealing with life and death issues and you need to be able to eat. And that could be, you know, three weeks, it could be four days, it could be sometimes it goes on for several months and that is not supposed to. So the military doesn't see these foods as being foods for the long term. And I think that's really where the problem is for the consumer, because the idea is you want to get the science um, and uh, it, that goes into combat rations, into consumer food items. Well, that science contains in it these values that are, you know, for this food that's intended to be used just for a short period of time in special circumstances, but we're eating it all the time. So yes. That, that, that's an issue. Yeah. Thank you. Could you tell me about the cake mix? <laughs> How does that relate to... Uh, Wait, uh, I'm sorry. The, no, the cake mix. Oh, the cake mix. Oh, actually, that's a, um, this also came out of the 1950s. And what a, it's really funny because I would say that many of Betty Crocker's products come from the military, including today, which is really funny because you think, you know, it's a house, this is the housewife's friend. Um, they had this whole thing um, that having to do with this pressurizing technique where they're selling mashed potatoes and stuff that you can buy on the shelf. But this 
particular product um, was created through a, uh, it, these mixes were for army cooks for, you know, quick breads <clears throat> and, um, you know, pastry and baked yeah. items. And the, what happened here is they've, they've um, reduced the water content there of the flours. So that, and obviously of the eggs and so forth that you, that you would be included in the, in the mix. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Well, I mean, cows here give white milk. Right? Yes. They have orange milk in Wisconsin, but sometimes you down in Texas you can't even find white cheese in the supermarket. It's all orange. Uh -huh. Yeah, I. That question, I I know why what they diet with, mm -hmm. and I know that it that people like it better, which is probably why they they. Uh, do, but I don't. I don't know. Why do they die? What do they die with? Well, um, a natto, which is a uh, it's a natural product. It's actually a South American. Um, I think that bush, but it has a little seed and it has this orangey red color. Oh, well, and so thank you so much for the presentation. Really. Thank you.